Hello, everyone in TV land. Uh, this is Rick Adams, once again, your host and producer for The Deadly Experiment. We are on the move, ladies and gentlemen. We're at a very critical time in our history as a people, as a nation, as a world, if you will, uh, at a time of a new incoming administration. We expect, but then again, as we're preparing this program today, we're not sure exactly what will happen within the next few hours or minutes. As you know, things are happening overnight very quickly. We had the release of this so-called news scoop concerning Mr. Trump and Russian spying and allegations that were proven to be basically made up from CNN to BuzzFeed and other networks that would carry it, essentially, that uh, Mr. Trump had some uh, liaisons and affairs in Russia and going back a number of years ago. Go. Well, folks, there is an attempt to derail the incoming administration of Trump. I'm not saying whether I'm for Trump or against him. That's not an issue here. The issue is, at all appearances, friends, we are being deceived as never before. And what do I mean by that, being deceived? Well, the whole world is deceived, Jesus himself said, and uh, men prefer darkness to light. That is, people do prefer to be lied to than told the truth. Well, who is a liar? Ultimately, the Bible says, he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ is antichrist, and the wrath of God abideth upon him. But that is what a liar ultimately will be. When all understand who and what Jesus Christ is, the Son of God, Yeshua Messiah. We haven't reached that point yet, but we're very rapidly descending to that point. So this whole business of politics as a cure for America's ills is a total and complete failure to begin with. It doesn't make sense. I've told you on previous programs that we cannot save the house from crumbling if we concentrate at the top, at the attic, the apex. We must look at the bottom, the foundation. If your foundation is gone in your house, it's going to collapse no matter what you do at the top, right? Of course, you understand that. I think most people who are reasonable can understand that. Now, are we at that point right now? Are we? Yes, we are at that point. Where America financially, in fact, most of the nations of the world, are now on a fiat money system, which means paper. It means debt. Economically, same thing. Our economy is not going to come back by building a wall tax, if you will, with Mexico or with any other nations for imports. In fact, we've reached the point now where the debt structure of the United States has grown within the last few months before Donald Trump was assumed to be president of the United States. The debt clock is just about approaching midnight. You personally are locked and loaded in debt, I guarantee. I guarantee 95% of those who watch this program are locked and loaded in debt. And that makes them a prisoner. A prisoner of who? The banks. And who are the banks? Who are the banksters, as we call them? Why, they're identified right here as the money changers by Jesus Christ when he sat in the temple. And he cleansed the temple that moment. Not permanently, but he cleansed it of the money changers. He overthrew the tables. He flung chairs. He was a violent man when he had to be. Jesus Christ was giving us a little sampling, a type of what he will be when he returns in judgment with a sword. He says, I come not to bring together, but to divide, to separate the what? The wheat from the tares, the good from the bad fig, the evil from the righteous. Are you prepared? Are you worshiping a false god right now? Are you worshiping the state of Israel instead of the God of Israel? Well, if you are, you're already in that Titanic, my friends. Many churches today, many people who are in these Bible-believing churches across this state and across this country are right in that position. They're, uh, shall we say, passengers getting ready to sink with no life raft. That's the analogy I use, because it's true. All of it is collapsing around us. Just by wishing America would come back again and the world would be at peace is not going to make it happen. 
Not until the Prince of Peace, the God himself of the Bible, comes and brings peace after he brings the sword. That's right. He's bringing the sword first, ladies and gentlemen, to cut down what? He's going to cut down the tares. He's going to cut down the poisons that are in the soil, that are contaminating you, just as today. We have infections today as never before, pulmonary infections, from these chemical trails, this geoengineering that's taking place above us in the sky, leaching down to the ground as never before. I don't because I take naturopathic medicines. That's what healed me, God healing through his nature when I was sick with a cancer. And the doctors would have killed me if I let them, because the great physician is the only one who can make that happen, the healing that God has prepared, and he will heal the nations of the world when he comes and brings his judgment, and then 1,000 years, folks, are going to be his reign, and if you're one of the Zadok, you've seen that Z on the screen in the past. That's not Zorro, it means Zadok, and that is the upright ones, those who have been chosen to lead in the millennial period to come from the first earth and heaven age. Now, I know I'm getting a little heavy for many of you, getting a little bit too deep. I don't mean to, forgive me. I'm trying to make a point that the whole world is deceived. And we're gonna show that deception in a couple of videos today about who and what surrounds Donald Trump? How did he come to be president? How did Barack Obama become president? Out of nowhere. And Jimmy Carter, we've referred to over the years, who was installed from oblivion. How did all of this happen? Who is responsible for it? Well, if you have this book, the Bible, in your mind, and you understand the words by translation, proper translation of the words, you'll understand who. See, that, that fig tree is pictured in the seed line. We see a satanic seed line, and you can see it for yourself. The seed line of Satan and his children. You say, well, that's ridiculous. Satan doesn't have children. He may influence children, but he doesn't have them on the earth. Oh, no? Well, then you're denying the words of the prophets, the words of the disciples, the apostles, and the words of Christ himself. What did Jesus Christ say? In the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and 39 onward to 44. He was speaking to the Jewish scribes and Pharisees, those who call themselves Jews and are not, but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. That uh, after he told them who he was, that his father was God and their father was not, well, they questioned him. And they said unto him, Abraham is our father. But Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now, he said, you seek to kill me. Would God's children kill the Son of God? No, but Satan's children would. As recorded in Genesis 3.16. Read it for yourself. The book of Genesis means beginning. The beginning of this age in which we live. And it didn't start with Adam. And Eve. No, populations were created on the earth way before Adam and Eve. So that science is right about that. They show that Adam, or Ethahadam, meaning the man Adam, and Eve were the first two Caucasians on the face of the earth. Why? Because the word Adam means to show blood, ruddy complexion in the cheek. Now, from Abraham, who descended from Adam, of course, we find he was the father of many nations. His name was changed from Abram to Abraham. And yet today, the children all around us who say they believe in Jesus, who say they love God, who say they are not necessarily believers, those who call themselves Jews, but they believe in God. Which God? Which God do they believe in, folks? That is the question. Well, Jesus answered them. And he said, ye do the deeds of your father. I do the deeds of my father. And they said, but we are Abraham's seed. And Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. But instead, you seek to kill me. And that they did. They used the Romans by proxy to do their dirty work. And Pontius Pilate says, I find no fault in this man, no cause worthy of death. And they screamed at him. 
they screamed and said, crucify him, crucify him. And they spoke with one voice, which means they were one tribe, the tribe of the seed line of Satan, the Kenites. Now, if you don't believe me, I don't care. Believe God. Either he's right or he's wrong. Which side are you on? Right now, we're going to take a look at the Trump factor and how Trump came to be president. Who is around him? Who is controlling his administration largely? And right now, let's get into that video. President-elect Trump, my friend, congratulations on being elected President of the United States of America. You are a great friend of Israel. I love Israel. Over the years, you've expressed your support consistently, and I deeply appreciate it. I look forward to working with you to advance security, prosperity, and peace. Israel is grateful for the broad support it enjoys among the American people, and I'm confident that the two of us, working closely together, will bring the great alliance between our two countries to even greater heights. May God bless America. May God bless Israel. May God bless our enduring alliance. It is time to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Her papers went out to all her friends at the banks, Goldman Sachs, and everybody else. President-elect Donald Trump turned to former Goldman Sachs banker and movie financier Steve Mnuchin to be the next Treasury Secretary. We're working on the economic plan and the transition, making sure we get the biggest tax bill passed. The 53-year-old was Trump's campaign finance chief, building a network of donors to support Mr. Trump's general election campaign. Mr. Mnuchin has strong ties to Wall Street after a 17-year career at Goldman Sachs, where he pioneered block trading, the selling of big chunks of shares at once. Mr. Mnuchin was born to a Jewish family in 1962, and his father also worked at Goldman Sachs. More breaking news in a busy hour. Charlie Gasparino in the newsroom has uh, word of a possible uh, cabinet appointment. What do you have, Charlie? Well, at least a consideration, uh, Connell, and this is uh, big for Wall Street because, uh, you know, this is one of the major players on Wall Street. And what sources are telling the Fox Business Network is, is that Goldman C COO, Gary Cohn, he's the number two guy there to Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO, is also being considered for energy secretary mm. after his meeting with President, uh, President-elect Donald Trump earlier in the week. Uh, from what we understand, Trump and, and Cohn, who met, I think it was on, on uh, Tuesday, had a very productive meeting uh, at Trump Tower. We, we, uh, we, we, we have some footage of, the, of him going in. There's been plenty of rumors about him uh, being possibly the OMB chief, but the other name that we're hearing they're considering is Energy Secretary. And I'll tell you, this comes as uh, rumors are swirling inside Goldman Sachs that Cohen, you know, who's been rumored to leave for a long time, he's been very un un unhappy being the number two. He's a very ambitious guy. He thinks he deserves number one. Lloyd Blankfein, now that he's uh, survived a cancer scare, is probably not leaving for a while. Uh, and he's getting itchy. Again, this is, and this has been going on for years. So every time there's been a G Gary Cohen story, uh, that he's leaving every two years, but this one seems like it's, it's got some, some, uh, some relevance here, particularly with his meeting with Trump. Uh, we should point out, him going as the energy secretary is a, pr is a pretty good fit. Uh, he's a commodities trader, right. he's pretty smart, and uh, you know, he's been doing energy-related work right. for a long time. It actually sounds like a better fit than OMB, than OMB right. uh, but that's where we are right now. We're not saying it's going to happen. We're saying that he's on the list, apparently, as a potential energy secretary. Very uh, and, uh, and, and, and he is, at right now, the rumor is inside Goldman, and they have not denied this, that he is imminently, that, that he's looking to bolt out of there because he, he, it's either he wants this or he wants to be CEO, and he's not going to be CEO. Right, so you look to get out for that. Thank you, Charlie. Well, there you have it, folks. Just a short presentation which gives you the facts about how Mr. Trump was selected and groomed for president a long time ago. That's why it came down to Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Hillary Clinton, well, despite the fact that she certainly had a large number of votes in those key states and almost 2.9 million votes in the popular vote over what he purportedly had, fact of the matter is just before 
just before, weeks before, the final tally was taken. We learned that George Soros, George Schwartz, the Eastern European Hungarian-born Kenite, came into a barrel of money again, and he put it into the machinery of Trump, as well as some other key people. Sheldon Adelson came up with a $25 million donation that he supplied, and he was putting his money on Trump. Now, these are people in the know, people who, by the way, like Soros, he has ties to voting machines, software program voting machines, I believe in 16 states at the time. So through his ancillaries and subsidiary companies, um, he was able to uh, boast that um, he could, in effect, and I'm not quoting him now, he didn't say this, but he could make that boast that we have our ways of engineering elections. Hillary had a lot of baggage, obviously. Trump has baggage, too, making him pray for the synagogue of Satan that Jesus described described in John chapter 8 to be able to take those skeletons out of the closet. We hear a lot about all of these, these hacking incidents, which essentially are nonsensical, to say the least. But there's a reason for Russia being involved. And that reason is because America, Israel, is going to be invaded at some point by Russia. This is all shown to us in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 38 and chapter 39. Rush is Russia. The prince of Meshach is going to enter into the land of Israel. Now that's the land of an unwalled city as it's spoken of in Isaiah. Not that walled city of Jerusalem, but America where the 10 northern tribes known as Caucasian Israel came to settle here in this country. We don't even know who we are, do we? We don't know our identity, but they know their identity, the Kenites, the sons of Cain. They sure do. Their home base is in Jerusalem. As uh, we're going to see right now, Brother Nathaniel, who is a convert from uh, Judaism to Christianity, and I believe him, he has leveled it out pretty, pretty good as to what Trump says he will do, at least on the campaign trail, for his buddy, Bibi Netanyahu in Israel, the mad-faced bulldog terrorist leader of the Zionist regime. Right now, Brother Nathaniel will give us his views on Jerusalem being that undivided capital. Can Trump move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? He can, but it would be criminal and a bad idea. When the United States stands with Israel, the chances of peace really rise and rises exponentially. That's what will happen when Donald Trump is president of the United States. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. There's nothing eternal about Jerusalem. It was only the capital of all the territory of Israel for a mere 169 years. And as eternally promised to the Jews, God's destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD mocks that myth. And why do we want a Jewish state when the Bible calls earthly Jerusalem, Sodom and Gomorrah, where our Lord was crucified? That was a criminal act and moving the embassy to Jerusalem is criminal too. For Jerusalem is under military occupation by the Israeli regime. Under the Geneva Convention of 1949, of which America is signatory, an occupying force is forbidden to settle its citizens, and nations must press for a negotiated status before affirming legitimacy. By moving its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, America breaks its own binding pledge. Moral high ground falls to the ground when you can't even honor your own word. And those American values that Israel claims to share flies out the window by violating international law crafted to protect the weak from vicious aggression. Jews want all of Palestine for themselves by theft 
by genocide, by ethnic cleansing for their greater Israel agenda. Now, if Palestine were declared a state, then Israel would be in breach of UN Charter's Article 51 that grants the states the right of collective self-defense. Bye-bye to Israel's settlers. Walls, fences, checkpoints, and soldiers from the occupied lands. And guess what? A Palestine Declaration of Independence was proclaimed by the governing arm of the Palestinian people in 1988, fixing its validity on the UN Partition Plan of 1948. 136 countries recognized the declaration. Now the UN must discharge its duty by fully recognizing the state of Palestine. But as long as the tail, Israel, wags the dog, Jumerica, that's not going to happen. We've had enough bad ideas. Making Israel a state was the first one. And moving the embassy to Jerusalem means more wars for Israel and more blowback in America's face. America hasn't learned History 101 just quite yet. Oh boy, doesn't that tell you something? Aren't we heading that direction? When Jesus Christ himself said in the book of Matthew, the gospel in 24, 25, and he said it again in Mark and Luke, he said that when I come back to the earth, I'm coming with an army and I'm coming to cut down and separate the wheat from the chaff. I'm going to destroy the wickedness of what city? That city of Jerusalem. Believe it or not, some people think that that Babylon, city of Babylon, the great whore of Revelation, is America. Or they think it's Saskatchewan. They think it's, you know, it's Australia, Sydney. No, it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the city of peace. Is it a peaceful city now? It's an occupied city, illegally occupied, by these children that Jesus himself denounced. Now, Jesus said, going further, in John chapter 8, 39 to 44, ye say ye are the children of Abraham, and God be your father. He turned to them and said, but ye are of your father the devil, Satan meaning he procreated them in Genesis chapter 3 and 4. The seed lines are there. No, I don't mean a serpent on a tree. Genesis records that when Adam and Eve conceived, that the serpent, the two-legged creature, that is the enchanter, procreated with Eve because she was wholly seduced, ex partio in the Greek. She was seduced sexually. She didn't bite an apple off a tree, folks. When she was seduced and bore Cain, Cain started that seed line that is with us today. What city? Jerusalem. They have to fulfill God's prophecy. Donald Trump could be their man to do it. He could be their sixth Trump. The sixth is Satan's number, 666. Satan in a flesh body coming back in the temple in Jerusalem. That will be the end of the final period of time before Jesus comes. So he tells them, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was what? A murderer from the beginning. When was that? Cain. He murdered his brother Abel. Okay? He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has no truth in him. For he has no truth, but he is a liar from the beginning. So to sum up, those are Jesus' own words in John chapter 8. Read it from 39 onward to 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own children. It's that simple. Not very nice, not very pleasant, but then again, would Jesus be allowed to say these words now in America today? He'd be arrested as a hate criminal. He'd be chained. He'd be brought before some magistrate and sentenced as a hate criminal. See, that's real hate. When you hate God, when certain people on the earth hate God, Jesus said, he who hateth me hateth my father also. So who hated Jesus? 
the Kenites, the sons of Cain, those who call themselves Israel and Judah and are not, but do lie and are of that, what? Synagogue of Satan. My friends, if it sounds like we're on fire today, we are because time is very short. Time is so short you have no idea. Most people who are scratching their little heads now, they're saying, what's going on? I don't understand this. You know, Steve Mnuchin, I don't understand. Cohen, Mark Cohen, Mike Cohen, Bill Cohen. I don't understand what this is all about. Steve Bannon, you know, of uh, the, the Breitbart News Organization. And, uh, and of course, we, we talk about Priebus, you know, the strategists. Friends, <laughs> whether it's a, it's a Priebus or whether it's a Summers or whether it's anybody else in this administration that supposedly is leaving office, the Obama administration, Okay, it doesn't matter. David Axelrod, they're of one lineage. Essentially, all of them come from that lineage of Cain. And they have to do their job. Now, our people, that is the true Israelite, Adamic, Caucasian, Israelite, Jacobite people of the Bible, for the most part are not doing their job. They're not worshiping their God, the God of the Bible. They're worshiping Moloch. They're worshiping these little gods, Balaam, in a sense. That's why they celebrate Easter and roll eggs. They don't celebrate the Passover as we do. Jesus was that Passover lamb. So if you're misled religiously because you're not studying the word of God and understanding what's happening right now in the world, then you are going to be set up for every other lie. And the biggest lie of all right now is that somehow this economy is going to churn around under Donald Trump's administration, or any administration. Somehow we're going to bring back jobs, real jobs to America. People are now working three jobs daily, some of them, part-time jobs to try to make ends meet, and they're like that little rodent on a treadmill, they're still going nowhere. They're not able to pay themselves out of debt. They're declaring bankruptcies, they're remortgaging, refinancing, and guess what? They're not going to come out of bondage. Why? Because the Kenites have you in bondage, in debt. And that's what mortgage means. Death, morte and gage, a grip. Mortgage, they own you. And when the time comes, when the banks close, as Roosevelt did in 1934, when the Gold Reserve Act was passed, he closed the banks in 1933 and 34. He said, let us solve the Depression and help restore economic stability. Well, he stole the real money from the people under penalty of prosecution and penalty of imprisonment, and then gave it to the banks, the same people that Jesus, uh, shall we say, accosted, uh, had a little beef with in the temple when they were ringing the cash register. Mm -hmm. You get the picture now? Friends, we're slaves. We're a debtor nation. We're not a debt-free nation. And that makes you pray for control. We're out of time, just about. Remember, this program will be on YouTube. We continue to broadcast on the Republic Broadcasting Network, and that's republicbroadcasting.org every Saturday from 2 to 4. I thank you all for watching. Get in the Word. Come out of the bondage of the churches. And I say again, Rick Adams, your producer, may Yahweh bless his elect. <laughs>